So last time we talked about how to resolve the stress on the fault, and we talked about the shear stress magnitude. So we ended up with some, you know, formulas essentially that you'll code up that end, end up giving you uh, a tau in the dip direction, a tau in the strike direction, and some normal stress. And by the way, this is the, I, I try to be consistent whenever I use a sigma, I'm talking about the effective stress. So in this case, it's, you know, it's whatever the, the resolved normal stress is minus the pore pressure. And so then, whatever the, you know, what's the, if we know the components of the shear stress, what's the magnitude? Square root is the sum of the squares, right? So, so then, the total shear stress is that. So then, if you your your equation to determine if a fault will slip or not is this equation. And this is at the instant of slip. Right. So another way to write it a lot of times is, is you, write, you write some uh, inequality like this. Because you can, this term over here can never really be positive. Um, if, it, if it were positive, you'd, you'd have some type of material separation. Um, if, it's, if it's sliding, they're still in contact. They're just <coughs> sliding along with one another. So this is sort of a restatement of this. but. But in, in, you know, strictly this equation where you have the equal sign is at the instant of slip. So the ratio of shear to normal stress will be equal to the coefficient of friction at the instant of slip. Okay. So the coefficient of friction is a material property. Right? We, we assume it's measured and given. Okay. And it has to do with the surface roughness of rocks. You know, so as they slide across one another. So in, when written in this inequality term, if this thing if, if this thing is less than zero, then it's not sliding, and if it if it is you know, equal to zero, it, it's sliding. Again, it's strictly it, it can't really be greater. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, so this is the simplest friction model there is. This is called Coulomb friction. Um, there are there are very there are far more um, elaborate friction models. We know uh, we know that under many cases this is not a good model. This this is fairly good at predicting the instant of slip, but after the fault is sliding, then it's better to use some type of dynamic friction model, which uh, it's typically a function of the velocity of sliding and other things. Um, you know, in petroleum engineering applications, we're really trying to, uh, you know, from from the standpoint of like induced seismicity, we really just want to avoid slipping altogether, right? So you don't really care what happens after the slip because it's bad. Right? You just don't. I mean, a slip is an earthquake, right? And, uh, a fault slipping is an earthquake. So we really just want to try to design below this threshold at all costs. Right? So, you know, here's some data for if you plot for a bunch of different rocks, uh, if you plot the shear stress versus normal stress, for, and all of these labels, I know they're hard to see here. You can, this, this figures in Zobach's book on, on page 126. Uh, and you can probably see a little clearer. But all of this data uh, falls in here. And so then if you draw some lines uh, in that, you can see that all the data falls sort of in this bound between a, a slope of 0.6 and 1. Most of it's in there. So this is saying that, I mean, this is essentially the coefficient of friction. Right? So the coefficient of friction for almost, you know, this is a, 
a lot of data on a lot of different rocks, the coefficient of friction is almost always in the range of 0.6 to 1. Right? And in fact, um, you know, unless you unless you know a reason, you know, a good rule of thumb is just to use 0.6. So if I don't specifically tell you what the coefficient of friction is for a rock, you just assume it's 0.6. Right. Uh, so I think in Zobach's book, he quotes uh, another famous rock mechanics author, <laughs> Jaeger, to say something like, um, you know, the coefficient of friction of rocks is always 0.6 right, until it isn't, or something like that. Right. So anyway. For in this class, we'll, we'll almost always just use 0 0.6. Yep. Uh, okay. So when a rock splits, uh, is that point 0.6 continuous? And then at what point do you know if that is the same rock that you just had in the middle? Again, this equation that we're talking about here for Coulomb friction predicts the instant of slipping. Right? What happens after that is much more complicated. But yeah, I mean, wh what you feel is uh, what you feel are the shear waves generated from that slipping. Right? Uh, so when you, you know, when when it slips, it, it generates stress propagate, stress waves propagating. Right? So I mean, everything, all motion, propagates via stress waves. Right? So if I if I hit this pin, you watch it fly through the air. Right? If we could zoom, way, you know, if we could zoom in on the end of the pin, and as I hit it, at the instant I hit it, this side over here doesn't know I hit it until, you know, a nanosecond later, actually a few few milliseconds later. Right? I don't know what this I don't know what the speed of sound is in plastic, but you know, it's like 5,000 meters per second in steel. Right? So. Um, so when I hit this thing, there's a wave that moves to the other end. And if you can zoom in on it, and you can actually with high-speed cameras uh, and like steel bars and stuff, you can, you can zoom in on it and you can see like if I, um, if I whack this in and I, and I look over here, what you see is that the, the pin actually moves like this through the air. You sort of I whack this in, then it, it moves like that. Right? So everything actually moves. Uh, due to stress waves, even my voice, you know, it's just, my voice is a stress wave moving through the air, essentially, right? Uh, and, that you got, and then vibrating your eardrum, and you can hear it. Um, so, so yeah, when there's an earthquake, then the slip generates a, a little shear wave that propagates through the earth, and then, and then that's what we feel at the surface. And and that that process is is pretty complex, you know, and over large distances. Because at every at every other fault, at every interface, you get wave reflections, you get so it's a lot of complexity. Um, since we're talking about earthquakes, of course we we uh, we, we tend to make it make it not sound so bad in petroleum engineering by giving it a fancy name. Induced seismicity. That's what we that's what we call earthquakes that are generated due to typically wastewater injection, right? So this is uh, a big deal. You hear a lot about it now associated with hydraulic fracturing, right? So in, in hydraulic fracturing, you use a lot of water, and then you begin to produce that water back when the wells come into production, and you have to dispose of it somehow. And the most economical thing to do in most places is to inject it deep. Um, and so this is what's caused a lot of the earthquakes in Oklahoma. And, uh, and in the Barnett Shale in North Texas. Um, so there's been a lot of research in, in recent years on how to, how to prevent uh, induced seismicity. But this is not a new phenomenon. So this is actually, um, this is in the 60s, right? So this is a Rocky Mountain Arsenal in Colorado in the 60s. And the solid line are earthquakes, no, essentially number of earthquakes uh, of, of one point of magnitude 1.5 or greater, okay, and then the dashed line is th the volume of uh, the average mo monthly pressure at the bottom of the well, and so you can see whenever you know that the earth the, the frequency of earthquakes 
is almost identically uh, corresponding to uh, whenever the pressure is high in the reservoir. Mm -hmm. And so while we, uh, it's received a lot of attention lately due to hydraulic fracturing, it's not a new phenomenon uh, induced seismicity. So, how do you think you can prevent this? Yeah, well, you, you have an equation now. You don't have to think, right? You can determine what the pore pressure, what the maximum pore pressure would be in the effect of stress to cause slipping, right? If you know the tectonic stresses. So you don't have to, you don't have to think about it anymore. If you know the fault locations, you can actually compute it, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, and it, it, it turns out, you know, in, in t from the perspective of hydraulic fracturing and the modern research, uh, it, it shows that, it, you know, particularly like in Oklahoma, it's, it's a little more complex than just the volume of fluid. It's, it's also the rate. And so they've recently uh, passed some regulations in Oklahoma to reduce the rate, the rates at which they're injecting. And, uh, and, and it has, because it allows for more you know, fluid diffusion <coughs> doesn't raise the pore pressure as fast. So it's a combination of rate and volume. Uh, and, and we've done, uh, Dr. Olson has a research group, uh, some of his graduate students have looked at this problem uh, of induced seismicity associated with hydraulic fracturing fairly carefully over the last couple of years. So uh, with that, 